Now, it's a delight to see all of you this weekend, and I <clears throat> thought a lot about today's message, uh, a lot of time reflecting. You know, uh, Memorial Day is uh, it's a significant weekend. In relationship to that, we're, we're, call- we're going to talk about s- sacrificial love. It's that which Jesus called this. He called it greater love. Everybody say greater love. Greater love. Yeah. There's the love of that which pleases us, the love of that which satisfies us, the love of that which we enjoy. But then there's something that Jesus refers to as, as greater love, or if you will, the sacrificial love. You know, Memorial Day uh, one time was called, uh, it was called Decoration Day. And uh, today it's the, it's the beginning of summer. It's when pools open. It's a time of barbecue and picnics. It's the first big holiday of the summer. It's the, it's the week that when gas goes up. In 1971, the federal government uh, changed it to the, the, instead of May the 30th, they changed it to uh, the fourth Sunday so federal employees could have a four-day holiday. Listen to me. You know, this is true about almost every holiday that we have. And holidays have turned into something that's about us and not about something that we remember. We understand that Christmas has become about a Fat man in a red suit and lots of gifts. And I, 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 I like Santa. He's, he's, he, he'd be cool. You can teach St. Nicholas out of that. You, you can come up with something redemptive. I'm always for redeeming things, you know. Okay. <clears throat> you know, we, drop, we put eggs out for, for, uh, for Easter, you know. And, I, you know, brought a lot of people, saw people saved. Uh, uh, once again, I, you, you, you can redeem a lot of things. And I think we should. But of all the holidays, once again, looking at this particular day, we, we look at Memorial Day. I was watching, uh, <clears throat> watching an interview on TV. It was on Fox News. It, it was, uh, but it wouldn't made any difference. You could have done it on Fox News. It could have been Jimmy Kimmel. It could have been on CNN. It, uh, you know, so many people have done this thing on the street where they interview people, and it's and it's just amazing how much or how little we know about our country. And if the interviewer had gone out and he would, he would have said, what's the number one song this week? And I'll be honest, I, I couldn't tell you what the number one, I couldn't tell you what the number one song in Christianity is. But I sure couldn't tell you what the number one rock song is or the number one country song. I, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But if you were to ask them that, they, uh, they could answer it. They, they would say, what's the big blockbuster coming out this week in Hollywood? And they, 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 they could tell you what that is. They'd say, who's, who's the most significant actors and actresses in Hollywood? And they, they, could, they could tell you who that is. And if you asked most of them, where did Michael Jordan go to college? Most of them could tell you. If you'd say, what's the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day? Very few of them could tell you. Veterans Day is a tremendous holiday, and we, we had a great service. I was in I was in uh, I was in Kenya, but I I, I, I saw you know the, the pictures and the photos and the things that were posted, and uh, it was a great service. We we honored our, our veterans here in our church, and and so Veterans Day is that day in which we honor those who serve their country, and rightly we should and will again. But Memorial Day is the honoring of those who made the ultimate sacrifice for the country. Do you know 1.4 million people have died defending what we call freedom? That is enough people to populate Phoenix, Arizona. 1.4 million. Started after the Civil War. I like to teach. I really love history. 
I think the, the role of the church, you know, there's a lot of things that overlap. I, I, I think patriotism and faith walk together hand in hand. Now, I think you can be a patriot and not be a person of faith, all right? I, I, I think you can, all right? But I think it, there's no doubt when you look at the founding fathers, it was certainly meant to be a, a mixture of it. So having had said that, you know, ma, you know, Memorial Day was originally called Decoration Day. Started shortly after the Civil War. About 1866, I mean, just, just almost immediately. And it happened both in the North and the South. There's a lot of argument. It could have started in four or five different places. Down in the Deep South in Mississippi. Can't remember the exact name of the town, but a group of about 20 ladies were going out, and they were going out to the cemetery, and they were going to decorate some of the, you know, the graves of their loved ones. You understand we lost over 600,000 people during the Civil War. In a nation this size, you understand, everybody was impacted by it. And so Decoration Day, and they would, they would take, take flowers, I believe that it was somewhere around May 4th or something of that nature. And, 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 and so these, these ladies, they were, they were at a cemetery, and, and they saw many of the Union soldiers had nothing by their graves. And, and they walked around, and, and they put stems of flowers on their graves also. And so likewise, in states like New York, New York, a city in New York is, is uh, probably the most popular one for uh, the ones starting um, what we call Memorial Day or Decoration Day back then. And, and uh, they closed all their businesses on that day because it's such a big deal. I remember once again, shortly after the Civil War, 600,000 people almost, every, everybody was affected. Everybody knew somebody. Everybody was related. And so they closed down all the businesses and so people could go out and, if you will, decorate those graves. Could you imagine what a terrible deep divide there was? And we think this nation is divided today, that this is our darkest hour. It's nowhere near our darkest hour. Could you imagine how divided our nation was after the Civil War? The Southerners, you know, they... They felt betrayed. The Northerners, once again, had, while they had won, they'd lost so much. There there was no great winners. Ultimately, those who won were those who gained their freedom. The the African-American community, the black community, certainly it was, it's meant everything to them. But a huge, great divide, and we were divided over these states' rights and racial issues. And that divide remained it in our country. There was a lot of animosity between the North and the South. But then World War I came, lost another 120-some thousand people in World War I. And after the end of World War I, almost unanimously, now there were still places in the South, they celebrated their own Decoration Day still, but unanimously across the country, what we begin to do, and that's when it began to be referred to as Memorial Day, the remembering of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. It wasn't a day of picnics. It wasn't a day to go to the lake. It wasn't just a paid holiday. It was a day to remember that people loved the country so much that they gave sacrificially. See, Memorial Day is about that, is about remembering. We see it as a break. It's remembering the 1.4 million who served the country. To remember the men and women for a service person's wage. Paid the ultimate sacrifice for a service person's wage. Many times it's not even as much as a manager makes at Walmart. Paid the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. It's about honoring their bravery. It's about remembering the young men and women see, because, you know, when we go to a cemetery, we think about old people. 
But if you go to Arlington, the vast majority of people buried at Arlington are not old people. They're young people. Young people who never had a chance to grow old. It's remembering that there are ideas and principles that we get to live with and enjoy. And they got to die for. And that's what Memorial Day is really all about. It's about what? It's about remembering. Thank you, Lord. You know, some things ought to be solemn. Ought to be reverent. And certainly those, these are those sort of things. I've never put on a uniform. I've never taken an oath to defend the country. But I thank God for those who do. Thank God for all those who willingly, once again, paid that price. In John 15, 12, you see that uh, everybody will remember years ago, the, the song, there's just events in our country that continues to, to bring the song back to the forefront. It ebbs and flows over the years, but it's become a great patriotic song, though it's a country song. B. Greenwood wrote the song, I'm, I'm Proud to Be an American. At least I know I'm free. He talks about the man who died, uh, gave that lot right to me. I'd stand up next to him, declare it still today. 
He talked about the comparison between the cross and the Statue of Liberty. So if you will, that is a great analogy. Between the sacrifice that Christ makes for us, while we were unwilling, unloving. Do you know people who defend this country, they, they defend the people who protest. They defend the people who burn the flag. They, burn, they, they defend the people who malign our nation. And they defend the people who are clueless. But nonetheless, they defend them. And again, there are those who've just absolutely paid the supreme sacrifice. Jesus died for those who despised him, denied him, rejected him, and would have no part of him. Believing that that sacrifice would make a difference. And so we look at the text in John, the 15th chapter, verses 12 through 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And here's the word once again, greater love, greater love. It comes from the word megas, it's actually the word Medina. It comes from the word megas originally. So it doesn't, but it doesn't just mean when he talks about this kind of love, it, it's not just the enormity of it, though it, there is the enormity of it. And that's why it comes from that word. We use the word mega to s- describe something that's really big. It's, it, it's talking about a fullness, a fullness of. And another, another way that you might describe it, it, it this, this term gets thrown in there in its, in its definition in the Greek, and it's the word elder which is so odd. Because for so, many, for so many of us, if we look at these examples that we're remembering today, they were yet so young. Yet they went away and they, they did a man's job. You might say when you say the word elder, you're talking about the longest lasting measurement of love. It's the elder when you're talking about comparisons. Greater love. The longest lasting measurement of love. Love in its fullness expression. Greater love hath no man than this. Then he lay down his life for his friends. You know why Jesus did die for all the world? You know he's speaking to those that are very close to him, those who are near him. Once again, in remembering Memorial Day, you can make the same comparison that are those who they died to maintain the freedom of this nation. Others did benefit from it. World War I, World War II. High Europe benefited greatly. The Philippines, so many countries. Even Russia. So why they not only died for their nation or their friends, they also died for others. Jesus makes this comparison, but he personalizes it. He said, this is what greater love is. This is the greatest measurement of it. It's the longest lasting measurement of it. It's the fullest measurement of it. Greater love hath no man than this. And he what? Lay down his life. That he he make a sacrifice. Once again, it's what? It's greater. Greater love is this, it's, it's the giving of yourself sacrificially. That's what greater love is. It's the giving of yourself sacrificially. You know, I had a couple instances in, in you know, just, they were just moments, but you know, sometimes moments in your life just profoundly affect you. The first one I was setting years ago in mom's kitchen when it was where the community bank is, is now and. And uh, Carlos Elmore was in there, and uh, I had j- they just finished running a series in the newspaper about Carlos Elmore being a prisoner of war. Was you here then, Jeff, when they ran that? Uh, it, it was he was a prisoner of war for for multiple. It was it was three or four years. It was a significant period of time. Carlos Elmore ate rats. He was in a German prison camp. 
talked about the, how hard it was, how, how they watched people die. And anyway, Carlos was, he, he was a guy, he, you know, he, he could get worked up, you know, good Christian man, good Christian man. I mean, he was a Democrat to his bones, all right? He, he just was. Now, I never could understand how, how, why in the world that there would be those on, in his party that wouldn't be for the life of the unborn child. But apart from that, he, was a, he just was. Right? I, I'm, not, I'm making, I'm making a, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a story, you understand. I'm not, I'm not degrading him because I, I, I honor him. Anyway, Carlos was going on about, you know, Democrats and Republicans. And there was somebody after he left, I'm telling you, was he mad? He was mad. He said, well, I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. And I said, you don't know who he is, do you? He said, well, yeah, he's Carlos Elmore. He used to be the vocational tech teacher up here at Houston. I said, no, sir. He's a man who fought in World War II and spent multiple years in a prison camp for you. And he is darn well welcome to say anything that he wants to say. Had another moment in life, and it was somebody I loved, and, and uh, he loved me, is, is Andrew Kell. And you understand people go through things in life, you know, people who defend our country doesn't mean that they're perfect, isn't that right? But boy, they can still show, show perfect love. Andrew had endured plenty through the war. You'll notice that most people who went to war, they, they don't tell a lot of stories. Peggy will tell you that her dad's never talked about the war very much which is so many times true. I became pretty close to, uh, to Andrew over the years, and Andrew shared different stories concerning the war with me. But one day Andrew said this. He got to going on about them slanted-eyed Japs. I just hate them. Right? But you know, here's the deal. Right? You know, he was wrong about that, but he was right about so many other things. He was right in his service for his country. He was right in his willing to lay down his life. All right. And so why, once again, I, I could have been personally offended by that. Why my daughter-in-law is not, she's not Japanese. She lives on another island off the country of China, which was from Taiwan. She has slanted eyes. But you know, once again, it's, it's, it, we live in a day, once again, where we don't value and we don't honor you know, young, many of our young people today are just outraged sometimes over what previous generations feel and believe. Now, I probably feel and believe most of those things. But once again, I would that you would at least look in a manner that I did with my very good friend Andrew. And while I could have been offended by his slanted-eyed comment, because I got a darling granddaughter who has slanted eyes, I... I wouldn't be. Why? Because once again, she couldn't be here if he didn't go there. Once, and there's all those who went and never came home. Who never came home. They weren't old men. They weren't old women. They were young men. And they were young women. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 25, it says this, is husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Once again, he's talking about Christ's kind of love. What kind of love did, did Christ did? He, he did this. He, he willingly died. Certainly you could say it was unconditional, but as a willingness to surrender his life. Husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church. You know, and, and, and I always like to say something when I'm around the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and we're talking about husbands and wives and men and women. I, it's, you know, you can always, you can make several points in a message and always go back to the main message. Anybody who's ever been to a wedding has heard me read from this verse. I've, I've taught from it so many times. And wow, I mean, in the very beginning, as a very young pastor, I saw two things in this verse, and I began to call them way back then the pillars of relationships. But they're the building blocks of everything, not just of relationships, of societies. They're about love and respect. It says, husbands love your wives, but it says that wives should honor their husbands 
And there's this 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 ter- there's this line that so many times that and because of the way it's been used, oh, ladies just cringe. Wives submit yourselves to your husbands. And I, you know, one lady said, "If I hear that one more time." <laughs> I had a couple sitting right here. We had built on, and they were sitting right where Leon and Linda sat, and I was sitting on a chair in front of them, and I was doing my premarital thing. And and uh, they wanted to know if I'd do their wedding. I said, well, you need to know what I'm going to say before you decide whether or not you even want me to do it. You know, they didn't come to church here. And so I got to that part where I, I said, now I say, you know, the Bible says, wives, well, submit yourself. Say, oh, no, I agree with the rest of that, but I'm not doing that. And I said, well, if you listen to the full explanation, you might be willing to do it. I said, if he loved you the way Christ loved the church, could you submit to that? If he would willingly lay down his life for you, could you submit to that? Could you honor that? Could you respect that? And after a full explanation, she said, well, of course, I could do that. See, there's, there's two things It makes so many things work, relationships, society. Right? And you have, to, you have to ask this question. What does both sacrifice and submission have in common? You gotta, what, is, what are they? They're both this. They're both voluntary acts. You don't have to sacrifice. And you don't have to submit. You don't. You don't have to come to the foot of the cross, but you can. There's a surrender. There's a submission. We submit our hearts unto him. We give our lives to him. There's, there's a submission. People don't, people don't have to serve their country, but, but they do. It's what? It's voluntary. You don't have to. You say, "Well, you know, I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I got drafted." Well, in my day, there was a lot of people that got drafted that didn't stay, and so you still submitted. Submission and sacrifice have so much in common. In John the tenth chapter, verses seventeen and eighteen, he says, "Therefore, my Father loves me. Why? Because I what I lay my life down, that I might take it again." No one takes it from me. I lay it down my li- myself. He goes on to say, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to pick it up again. I've got the right. I've got the authority. i got the ability. That's why, I, that, 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 that's why they see abandoning your, 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 your people or your platoon or whoever it is in, in service is, is such a, a terrible crime. Because you had a right, but you surrendered that light. And to walk off and to pick it up again. Jesus said, the Father, what loves me? Not because I picked my life up. Not because I exercised my fullest right. Not because I took advantage of all my benefits. Because I did this. Because I voluntarily laid it down. I had the power. I had the right. I had the ability to pick it up. But the Father loves him. Why? Because he laid his, his life down. See, all great achievements require this, sacrifice. All great achievements. If you're going to go to school and if you're going to get a degree, it takes a certain amount of sacrifice. The higher that degree goes, the greater the sacrifice. It's harder to get a master's than it is a bachelor's, and it's harder to get a doctorate than it is a master's. It takes sacrifice. To have a country who maintains freedom as long as we have. Some 240 years. What's a tremendous thing. But it's required sacrifice over and over again. And the same is true on the part of Christianity. Christianity continues to require sacrifice. All great achievements require it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he said, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, 
and the less I be loved. Again, you, you find this true too many times in our society. This verse, you, you see it most recently manifested and sometimes the negative feelings toward law enforcement in our country. The more that I give, the more that it costs. The more that I love, the more that I give, the less I be loved. We've seen that in our nation when our men and women came home from Vietnam and, and they were despised and rejected and spat upon. Once again, this great comparison between what men and women do in the service of their country and what Christ did in relationship to the church. They what? They spat upon him. They despised him. They, they rejected him. But he said, I would, I gladly what? I gladly be spent. Listen to this. I, I just think this is a profound statement. Listen to this. Value the people who sacrifice something for you. Because maybe that something was their everything. Maybe that something was their everything. Look at some lessons from David. Came a time in the history of, the, of Israel and David had uh, had some sort of rest in the nation. He had solidified the kingdom and, and during his reign and things were going well and he decided he would number the nation, which was a tremendous act of pride. He was going to celebrate his accomplishments and we always have to be careful as a nation that we, we don't begin to think that we did this thing ourselves. So David's going to celebrate their accomplishments and what they've done. He's going to number. He's going to take a census of the country. And this thing greatly displeased, displeased the Lord. And, and the nation fell under judgment. After a period of time, the prophet Gad came to him and said, uh, you know, you, you've displeased the Lord and judgment's coming. And here's the three things that could happen. And one of them was a plague would come and, David said, I'll just throw myself on the mercy of God. And so a plague comes, and in the midst of that plague, the Lord sends the prophet to speak to him again, says, it's, you're going to have to do this, David. All right? You're going to have to make a sacrifice. You're going to have to make a sacrifice. And you know, we're all going to have times in our lives that that's going to be the truth. To turn the tide, we're going to have to make a sacrifice. And when it's time to make that sacrifice, what are we going to do? In 1 Chronicles 21, verses 20, 22 through 26, it says, And then David said to uh, Orman, he said, he said, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me... Uh, for a full price, that the plague may be stayed of the people. And Oren said unto David, Take it to thee. Let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen and also the burnt offering and the threshing floor for wood and, and the wheat and the meat offering. I give it all. And King David said to Oren, Nay, I will verily buy for full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer birth offering without a cost. So David gave me, Oren, for a place of 600 shekels of gold by weight. David built an altar there unto the Lord, offered burnt offerings, and peace offerings. You know, there's some things in life to learn, not only about those that we have seen go before us, but I mean, just how we can apply these things to our own lives. See, in a time of personal crisis, all right, responsibility is necessary. Responsibility is necessary. David repented. You know, David could have just continued to let the nation suffer. 
Let them pay the price. He's the king. Let them suffer. But a time of crisis, personal responsibility is necessary. So often that is the thing that disappoints you and I when we look to the, to the political realm and we look to those who serve, you know, serve. And, and, and so many times, now I'm not saying always, and I'm not saying everybody, because I believe there are good people who serve and there are honorable people who serve and, 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 and they do what's right in their conscience and they, 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 they believe that they're doing right by God or their constituents, whichever the case may be. But so many times we th see things that are just done surely for expediency. No personal responsibility. You'll also find in a time of personal crisis that, a, that sacrifice is necessary. And listen, here was, Oren said this, I'll give you, I, I'll give you the land. I'll give you the wood. I'll give you the oxen. I'll give you everything you need. Listen, he said, let me do it for you. Let me do it for you. See, my concern is, is this concerning I, whoever it, may, it might be, me, you, us. Are we always just going to let somebody else make the sacrifice? Yeah. How many years ago, <laughs> you'd have thought such a small thing. We'd gone to Chicago, and uh, we'd gone up there. We was uh, doing uh, street ministry in Chicago, and, and uh, we went up there. We worked in a food kitchen. Uh, we worked in a homeless shelter. We, ju we just did all kinds of stuff while we was up. Did you make that trip, Ryan? Yeah. Anyway, we, remember that bus ride? Dennis drove the bus. Dennis almost got me dog bit. Yeah, if I'd have got if I'd have died by German Shepherd, it'd been Dennis's fault. <laughs> That's another story. Anyway, <clears throat> so anyway, that uh, we we ride this bus and it's it's June, except you know uh, it's it's not June like it is right now. It's ninety eight degrees June, and we're on the school bus. We're headed to Chicago. Boy, it's hot. But anyway, we get up there, and, and uh, they're all excited. It was great to watch these kids go to Chicago. Many of them have never been to a, a city of that size. Now, not all of them, but many of them have never been to a city of that size. And we're coming up the Dan Ryan Expressway. I, this is my home turf, you understand? We come up the Dan Ryan Expressway. We pull onto Lake Shore Drive. You know I mean? You're just driving through city. You'd been, you'd been looking at the hood, you know? But when you turn off Dan Ryan Expressway and you head up Lake Shore Drive, all of a sudden missionaries became tourists. I mean, they went from boom, boom, like this. The bus was shaking, and it was great. But we got up there, and we pulled off in a neighborhood. And uh, nonetheless, it, we were there to, we did street event. They did the, uh, they did the champion. They did Carmen's champion. I, we saw people saved. It was, it was just tremendous. Right? I want you to know that the people up there, we had, we had, we had kids from 13 to 17. The oldest kid we had was 17 years old. They said was the best group they ever had, said they were the best soul winners they ever had, and they were the most courageous people they ever had. Amen. And the youngest. You'll often find the youngest are the most courageous. Anyway, that uh, we went I wanted to help them get up there, but yet I felt it necessary to get home. I'm, you know, I, I just sometimes over the top. And so I felt like I needed to get home. I, I had some family come pick me up after we'd gotten. They got settled in. I got on a plane, you know, land, you know landed in St. Louis, all right, 10 o'clock at night, got in the car, drove home, got home about 1 o'clock in the morning by the time we got everything. Of course, was here in church the next day, but be up 1 o'clock in the morning was no deal to me. Now, the folks who came pick me up, it was a deal. It was a deal. I heard him moan all the way home. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> it was Jim Carter. No, it wasn't. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It wasn't Jim. <laughs> you don't know who it is, all right? <laughs> I just think it's great. Okay. Now, here's... We're talking, about, we're talking about just small sacrifice. What happens when the day comes 
And you got to make a real sacrifice because there's a real crisis. Yeah. See, David wouldn't let somebody else make the sacrifice for him. He wouldn't. He wouldn't let somebody else fund it. He wouldn't let someone else pick up the tab. David wasn't entitled, even though he was a king. Lessons from David. The sacrifice comes at this. It comes as an expense to the one making the offering of the sacrifice. It comes what? It comes at their expense. It comes at their expense. You're always grateful. It's, un it's unfortunate how often it is the few that make the sacrifice for the expense of the many. What would happen if we lived not in a, just in a nation, wow, I, that would be tremendous. But what, what, what if we just lived in a community? What, what, if we, what, what, if, what, what if it was just the church that was always responsible? What if it, what if, what if it was the, you know, the, the church that would always make the sacrifice, do the sacrificial love? What if it was a church that always would pick up the expense? You understand, I'm talking about the, the denying of oneself, the yielding of one's rights. Thomas Paine said this, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. There just is no sacrifice when no cost is incurred. There is no sacrifice when there is no cost incurred. How would that every time that the church went to do something that everybody said, boy, there's got to be, I, I, I've got to do my part. I've got to do my part. What, what's, what's, my, what's my cost? What's my sacrifice? What's my investment? What's my responsibility? And not just always, just casually know this. That the few will so often carry the weight of the many. Galatians 6, 5 says this, For every man should what? Bear his own what? Burden. See, we looked by looking at David. See, today blessing is exchanged for entitlement. See, there's nothing greater about entitlement. There's nothing greater than it. There's nothing great about it. There's nothing superior about it. There's no largeness involved. There's no honor in it. There's nothing meaningful. Generations won't remember it. And nor will it make a difference. In Philippians 2, 6 and 7, it says, though he was God, we're talking about Jesus. Though he was what? He was God. You understand that Jesus refers to his humanity Christ refers to his deity. He is the pre-existed one, the incarnate one. He was in the beginning. The word was with God. The word was God. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God was something to be clinged to. Instead, he gave what? He gave up privilege. He gave up privilege. In his case, divine privilege. See, sacrifice started long before the cross. The voluntary investment, the greater love began long before the cross. Though he was God, he did not think equality was God was something to cling to. He did what? He gave up divine privilege. Philippians says this is, follow God's example. 
I can't believe I've spoke that long. I just looked the clock. You'll forgive me. Follow God's example in everything you do. Just as much as a much-loved child imitates the father. Wow, to imitate the son who what? Who imitates the father. I got two quotes, but they're worth your time. The first is Ronald Reagan. Once again, Ronald Reagan, I, I, thought was a, I thought was a great man, flawed man, yeah, but a great man. Ronald Reagan said this in speaking at all, in Arlington on a Memorial Day, speaking of those stones with crosses and stars. Most of them were boys when they died. They gave up two lives. The one they were living and the one they would have lived. I cried when I read that. When they died, they, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. You understand we were looking at women too and you could have just add the adjective. Or the pronoun, I apologize. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country and for us. And he says, and all we can do is remember. I got one last thing. I had to look it up because I couldn't remember it. I couldn't do it from memory. I love Adams, Jefferson. Adams says this in his, his closing line when he writes to, he's, he's writing to Abigail, and he says this. It's one of his famous quotes. Posterity. You will never know how much it costs this present generation. See, those who won World War I could have said that to the next generation, and those who won World War II could have said that, and those who went to Nam could have said that, and those who fought the Gulf War could have said that, and those who fight the war on terror could say the same thing. The next generation will know, not know how much it costs. Posterity alone, you will never know how much it costs this present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope that you'll make good use of it. If you do not... I will repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. See, it is incumbent upon us. On a day that we kick our summer off, and if you, don't feel bad if you're having a picnic this afternoon. You know, feel bad if you're at the lake and you're listening to me right now. <laughs> it was easy. All right, it's a softball. Listen, in the year 2000, Congress passed a declaration that on Memorial Day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I bet you, I bet, I, I bet you, I, I bet you, such a small percentage of, this, of the, our nation even small, small, we're minuscule. Less than five percent, maybe less than one percent. At three o'clock in the afternoon, is to observe a moment in silence and honor of those who have paid the supreme price, remembering those who have died from the Revolutionary War to this present war on terror. See, remembering once again, I just, just impacts everything. See, I, nothing will be changed if I can't tell you what the blockbuster movie is right now. My life and your life and the lives of those around me would be better if I remember those who have fallen and gone before me. Can you say amen? Every head bowed, no one looking around. We're going we're to also have communion this morning. But first of all, that we talked about that sacrifice, the comparison between Christ and the many men and, and women who have served their country and paid an ultimate sacrifice. They died to preserve freedom. 
Jesus did die to set us free, but he died to set us free from the pains of death, from its clutches. To set us, to, to change our destiny, to save us. One provides a, an, a natural benefit, an earthly benefit. The other is eternal. You might be here this morning and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Jesus Christ. If you haven't, this would be that time. See, somebody else made a sacrifice. All we, what's incumbent upon us is remembering it, honoring it. How do we honor it? We respond to it. We become recipients of it. We acknowledge it. We allow it to define us. We allow what he did at the cross to define you, to save you, to transform you. If you're here this morning, you've never been saved. In just a moment, we're going to pray. I'm not asking you to join this church or if you've ever joined a church. I'm not asking you if you've got papers, you've ever been baptized, or that you've ever received a Sunday school pen. I'm asking you, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? For as many that believe upon him, John, the first chapter, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God. Romans 10, if thou shalt confess, say with your mouth, Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, for with the heart we believe, with our mouth, our confession, our declaration is, be made, is, our declaration is made. We're going to pray. Can you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son? Can you believe that he lived and that he died and that he died on the cross? Can you believe that he was raised from the dead? If you can believe those things, you could be saved. In just a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to invite everyone to pray. You might be here and say, Pastor Bill, I've wandered in my faith. I've, I've strayed. I've not been as faithful as I should be. Would you just reaffirm your faith this morning? We're going to pray, inviting everyone to pray with us. Say this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. And I believe He died. I believe He died on the cross for me. I believe He was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Become my Lord. You're my Lord. I'm God's child. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.